This is our last sermon in the book of James. We've been going through the book of James for the past few weeks. So, um, so let's go ahead and dive in because I got something to say. It's very important. I want you to listen. I want you to listen very closely. I think the Rubik's Cube is the most frustrating toy on the planet. I can't stand this thing. Can't stand it. I have tried. I have a little one, and I can't do it. I, I can't do it. Every, every, you know, I've tried. Kaysen, can you still do these? Okay, here we go. All right, let's see. Not to put you on the spot. Everybody, everybody look up here. Not to him. Not to him. Don't, 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 don't mess him up, okay? But I, I really do. I mean, I sit there, and I try, and I try, and I try to no avail. I mean, I'm just... I'm just sitting there playing with the thing, and I just can't do it. I know that there's a trick or a shortcut or, or, or an algorithm, whatever that means, you know, to solve it and stuff, and I just, I just can't figure it out. I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried. Um, and you know, that's kind of the way I feel when it comes to prayer. When it comes to prayer. I, have, I don't know about you, but I've studied prayer more than any other subject on the planet. I mean, I've read books upon books upon books on prayer. I've, I've gone on prayer retreats. I've gone on all kinds of different things to try to increase my prayer life. I'm even reading a book right now called Learning to Pray. All right. Uh, but, but just like my frustration with the Rubik's Cube, I try and I try and pray, but I just can't figure it out. I don't know if you can figure it out, but I just, I haven't found a way where, where my prayer life just seems so rich and, and, and fulfilling. I don't know if you are in the same boat. I don't know if you struggle with prayer or not. I know that I, know that I do. Did you throw it back up. What is this? That is ridiculous. <laughs> this is, this is, yeah, I, we'll, we'll have words later. Okay, uh, uh, man, can you, Good on you. That's good. All right. Love it. Um, but just like with prayer, I know that there's some trick. I know that there's an out. Did you take them all apart and put them back together? So, okay. Okay. Thanks. thanks. Yeah. Make me feel better. Okay. Uh, but you see with prayer, there are no tricks or gimmicks or an easy button. And don't we as humans love the easy button? Isn't that right? I mean, we love the easy button. We want something easy in our life. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why Jesus said uh, narrow is the way to life and, and broad is the road to destruction because it's just easy. We're just like, oh, I'll go down the easy path. And that's what we do over and over and over again. But what I want to tell you and what I think James is telling you is that prayer is essential and at the core of the Christian life. If you want to be in alignment with God, your life has to be in alignment with prayer. So let's go ahead and start reading in verse 13. It says, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Okay, so what he's saying is, look, in all circumstances, pray. Are you suffering? Well, you need to pray. Are you happy? Then you need to pray. Are you sick? You need to pray. Are you, are you this? You need to pray. If you're driving, you need to pray. If you're, before you go to bed, you need to pray. Uh, before you eat a meal, you need to pray. You need to pray, pray, pray. Our first response should always be upward to God in prayer, but so often that's not our first response, is it? I know that's not my first response. If I, when I suffer and I get sick, well, let's just take suffering for instance, you know, and I'm really anxious about something and depressed. What do you do? I know my first thing is I complain and whine. I get in bed and I watch old Kung Fu movies. That's what I do. All right, when I'm suffering, all right, I just want to disconnect from the world, and that's what I do. When I'm happy, my first response is not to say, thank you, God, for all the blessings that you've given me. My first response is to go out and to eat and celebrate and then go home and watch old kung fu movies, all right? And then, and then what, what about when, you, when I'm sick? What's, my, my first response is not, God, can you please heal me from this sickness? My first response is to go home, get in bed, drink NyQuil, and... Watch old kung fu movies. That's right. You, you're, you get me. You get me. Yes. That's, that's exactly what it is. But James is saying our first response should be to talk to God. Is that your first response? 
Is that your first response? Or is it something else? I want to, I want to tell you this morning, what good is a thought unless it's a prayer to God? What good is a thought unless it's a prayer to God? I, I want to encourage you, instead of just worrying about things, if, oh, I'm so worried about the future, or my finances, or my family, or uh, and all these other things, just put God's name in front of that and say, God, hey, I want you to know I'm worried about my family. I'm worried about my future. I'm worried about my finances. Do you see? It turns it from something that is absolutely useless and does nothing but harm you to something, and you're putting it in God's hands, the one person who can do something about it. Do you see that? Just the the whole change of mindset. What good is a thought unless it is a prayer to God? Our first response should be to pray to God. He says, we should be so in love with God that he should be the center of our life that we can't wait to tell God what is going on. Like a little kid who comes home from school. Uh, the other day, Soren came home from school and he got like um, a Gator of the Week or, uh, well, it, it's my kid, so Gator of the Year. I, I don't know what he got. Anyway, it was, it, was, it, was, it was this award, right? And he came in and he was like, Dad, 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 I got Gator of the, the Month or whatever. And he was so excited to share that news with me. He was so pumped and we put it on the refrigerator and stuff and it was, you know, my little artwork thing got bumped so that they could put his thing there. But anyway, it was, it was so awesome to hear that. What about like uh, when something happens uh, at work or during my day, I just, I really do like to go home and say, hey, Melanie, here's kind of what, what happened today. And, and, I'll, and I can't wait to share that with her or I'll call her on the phone and say, hey, this just happened or I just had this happen or, or whatever, whether it was good or bad or indifferent or whatever, we can't wait to tell them those people is it the same with God is it the same with God oh God I just uh this is this this thing is going so good in my life thank you so much I just can't wait to tell you oh God I just got news that 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 my uh, my brother is really struggling and I just I just I just need to lift this up in prayer is that our first response like I said so often he is not our first response so what I want you to do is take a moment and look at your life Is he the first love of your life? Does your life revolve around him? Do you have a deep abiding relationship with him? Or do you just know about him? Because this is a relationship and it begins and ends with communication in prayer. So let's keep reading in verse 14. It says, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Okay, so I'm going to go through three points in this passage. Number one, first notice that it says, if you are sick, call the elders, not the other way around. Okay, do you notice that? Call the elders, not the other way around. We live in such a consumeristic culture that, that uh, we, we think sometimes the leaders or the, the elders or whatever, they're great men, but they're not omniscient. They don't know everything that's going on in everybody's life, and, and, and they just can't do that. What it says is, no, 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 if you're sick and you need something, you call the elders and you tell them and they will come to you. Why? Because that's an act of faith. That's an act of faith saying, okay, I put my faith in you, God, and you said to do this, and I'm going to call them and make that happen. Uh, and, and, uh, and yeah, that's, a, that's an act of faith on your part. Number two, I want you to notice the interplay between sickness and sin. Sickness and sin. Is James saying that the person is sick because of their sin? No. No. All right? I... I I, I, I don't think that God works that way in, in some ways, all right? But I don't think it should automatically be ruled out because our sin does physically manifest itself at times. Have you ever been so guilty about something that it made you sick? I mean, maybe I'm the only one, but <laughs> I know I have. I've been sick to my stomach because of of I've been guilty about doing something. Have you ever been so anxious or fearful that you had just had to lay down and go to sleep? Have you, have you ever been so burdened that it started to affect your health? Man, I know I have. I've, I've lived with those worries before, being so worried that it made me physically ill. 
And, and I think sin can do that. What happens is when we keep hiding our sin and leave it unconfessed, what, what happens is it starts to eat away at, at our heart and our mind and it starts to manifest physically. You can, you can see it physically in our lives. And, and I know I'm going to tell this story and I know it's kind of gross, but, but it really illustrates the point and I'm going to be very vulnerable here. Like I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty honest, but this, is, this, this is a, goes to a point. But I want to illustrate just what unconfessed sin does to us. All right, so when I was a kid, um, there, uh, uh, I could watch whatever show I wanted. My parents didn't have any rules necessarily for, for what I wa- Well, The Simpsons. I couldn't watch The Simpsons. But I could watch Lethal Weapon and Die Hard and, and, you know, and all that other stuff, right? Well, uh, anyway, my cousins were all older than me, and they showed me Porky's one night. All right, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie or whatever, but, uh, but anyway, there's a scene in it where uh, the, these people like stick a snake down a toilet or whatever, and it comes up through the toilet to bite the teacher and, and all this other stuff. She freaks out and runs out of the room and stuff. See, I still, I haven't watched it in that many years and it's still, it's still stuck with me. Well, I saw that as a little kid and I was afraid to go to the bathroom after that, as you can imagine, right? You know, I mean, a snake coming up through the toilet, you're like, whoa, you know, that's freaky and stuff. So what I would do is I would, I would hold it and not go. I would stay away. I wouldn't do anything because I was afraid a snake was going to come out of the toilet. And my parents took me to the doctor because it, it, they were worried about me, as you would and stuff. And the doctor said, hey, and, unless we do something drastic, we, we need to keep him from dying. Because it was, it was getting to a point where it, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. And I believe the reason I'm bringing up this story, not to gross you out or anything like that, but I, I want you to hear, hear the effect of what unrepentant sin does to our soul. Unrepentant sin, when we, when we hold it in, when we push it down, when we try to hide it from others, all we're doing is killing ourselves. All we're doing is killing ourselves. It's, uh, it's, it's like, uh, uh, what's that, the whole thing with forgiveness, drinking the poison and expecting the other person to die or whatever. But that's what it does. You just hold it in. And we need to learn to confess our sins one to another. And in our tradition, we haven't necessarily been good at that in the church of Christ. Our confession model is broken in a lot of ways because what we've done is, if you remember, uh, this is our confession model. Please come while we stand and sing. And then the, you have to sit down in the front pew. You, you kind of say something, but you make it vague because you know the elder is going to get up here and kind of say it to everybody. So you don't want to be too specific and stuff. And that's what we do. And, and I think a lot of things keep us from confessing. I think pride keeps us from confessing. We, one, some of us don't even think we sin. We think oh, our sin's not bad enough to confess or whatever. Or we sin, uh, we, we talk about sinning in the abstract. Well, you know, God, I, uh, forgive me for my sins, but we never really get specific. We say, Father, forgive me for my sin, but never actually get down to what that sin is. And two, I think we don't, we don't confess our sins one to another because we're embarrassed or ashamed or afraid of being judged. But I want to tell you today, the prerequisite to walk through this door is that we are sinners saved by grace. That's what gets you in the door. You know, people tell me, oh man, I'm not going to church. The church is full of hypocrites. Well, of course it is. That's what gets you here. You know, that's what gets you in the door is to say, yes, my life is not in alignment with God. There are things that are off. Every time I walk through that door, I am confessing that I do not have it together that I do not have my life completely in alignment with God and I need God's forgiveness in my life. That's the power of repenting from our sins and we need to do that. And at the end of this uh, sermon, we're going to have elders and other prayer team members around the back. And if you need to confess sins one to another, I want you to do that. I want you to unburden yourself. Because what, what I think you will find is you will find someone who will pray with you, who will love you, who will accept you, and I know that you're going to find a God that loves you and accepts you as well. Don't be afraid. Unburden yourself. Because it's those things that we leave unconfessed that fester and that can kill us. Third, let me, let me talk about anointing with oil. The elders come and they anoint you with oil. Uh, as you can imagine, there's multiple explanations for this. James could be saying, pray for them and make sure they take their medicine. 
because oil was medicine. It still is and stuff like that. Uh, James could be saying that oil is like a physical expression of faith. Like in John chapter 9, when Jesus put, the mud over, uh, uh, Jesus put the mud over the guy's eyes and the blind man was able to see. Maybe they're, they're thinking that oil is a, is a physical sign of faith, showing that. Uh, or it could be a symbol or represent the Holy Spirit or a, a myriad of other things. But, but the bottom line is the Lord is the one who heals. The Lord is the one who heals. And people ask me, does God do miracles today? Is the miraculous still going? Oh, you bet. God does miracles every single day. We don't see them, but he does miracles every single day. It, it, does God do the miraculous? Yes, I think he speaks in a language that we understand. Now, some people may disagree with me on this, and that's fine. But I really do believe God speaks to us in a language that we understand. Here in the West, we are so scientific that God speaks to us through scientific means. We go to the doctor, we take medicine, uh, we have surgeries, we do all this stuff. But you and I both know, I mean, I had my gallbladder out a couple years ago, uh, and they didn't even have to cut me open. They did this like, they punched a hole in me, and I don't know, I don't know what they did or whatever, but isn't that a miracle? I, mean, I, I don't know. I think it's a miracle, right? I, I think it's incredible. And God did that. But I think in the East where they believe more in the supernatural and stuff, I'm not here to say that God doesn't work in that way. I'm not here to put God in a box. Too many years, uh, too many years of my life have been spent telling God what he can do and what he can't do. And I'm not in that game anymore. God is God and he can do what he wants to do. Uh, let's keep reading. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. It says this, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. Or I like one translation that says, Elijah was a human being just like us. Everybody say, just like us. Just like us. I want you to get that point. Elijah was a human being just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Uh, man, don't you sometimes look at the people of the Bible and think, oh, you know, they're just different than us. I mean, I'm like, how many times have you said, yeah, that was them, but I'm just Paul. I'm just Paul. I'm, I'm not one of those guys. I, I'm no Abraham or Noah or Moses or David. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a mighty man of God like Elijah or, or a faithful woman of God like Esther or Ruth or, or I can't rebuild a wall like Nehemiah or anything. Man, the, those were people of faith, but God is saying this through this verse. Yes, you are. Elijah was a man, what? Just like us. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe that? You need to believe it because he was just like us. And we have the same power at our disposal. Actually, I believe we have more knowledge and more power at our disposal than they even did in the Old Testament. We have, we have a God who, who knows our prayers before we ask them. We have Jesus who mediates on our behalf, who bridges the gap between us and God. And we have the Holy Spirit that speaks to God in words that he can understand. We have the whole Godhead on our side when we pray, and yet we think we're powerless. We have the whole Godhead on our side. Elijah was no different than us. He was a man just like us. The only thing that separated him from me is our faithfulness to God. I love Elijah. I love reading the stories of Elijah. I mean, I love the story of Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal. Don't you love that story? All right, so here, kind of let me set it up for you. Basically, the prophets of Baal, uh, you know, they... Um, they basically challenged each other to a, a, a God off or whatever, you know, of who, whose God is really the best. So they got two altars and they put two sacrifices on it. And, uh, and Elijah said, okay, prophets of Baal, you go first. And so they got out there and they prayed and chanted to their God. They even got to the point where they were cutting themselves to try to get God, their God's attention. Okay. And then I love this because Elijah, he's over here sitting next to like a little tree you know, I could just see him, and he starts, he starts ta taunting them. He says, hey, because um, they've been going all day long praying. And he says, hey, why don't you, uh, why don't you pray louder? Maybe, maybe your God doesn't hear you. Maybe your God doesn't hear you. Maybe he's uh, asleep. 
Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's deep in thought. Maybe he's busy. So, so what did they do? They shouted louder. They did what he said. And so they started shouting louder. But in the end, this is what it said. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. And then Elijah steps up and he has them drench the altar and the sacrifice with water. And we can talk about that later and what that meant. And this is what he prays. And this is what I want you to do when I read this prayer. I want you to count to yourself how many seconds it took him to say this prayer. And I'm going to read it slow even to give him to give a little bit more dramatic effect to, to maybe think that he, he did more dramatic effect with it or whatever. But just start counting. All right, ready, go. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, are Lord, um, you Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Okay, stop. What'd you get? 22? Okay, I got 22. What do you want to give? What? I got a 2 to 10. I got 22. Uh, 22? 22? Yeah, yeah. Okay, less than 30 seconds, right? These people have been praying all day long with loud cries and screaming out to God all day long. And he steps up and gives a 22 second prayer, and fire from heaven comes down and consumes the entire altar and the sacrifice. What that tells me is it's not how long we pray, but it's how much faith we pray with. How much faith we pray with. It says, notice, Elijah was a human being just like us. The prayer of a righteous person truly is powerful and effective. And the question is, do we believe that church? Do we believe it? Do we believe in the power of prayer? Do we believe that God will answer our prayers? Elijah did. He didn't just believe it, but he acted upon it. He didn't just believe it, but he acted upon it. And that is the whole point of the book of James. It, it, it ends the way it begins. Someone not just believing in something, but believing to the point where he actually acted upon it. That's the way we need to get as a church. People, we, I know intellectually we believe we have a God that created the world and, and spoke the world into existence and did all these things. We believe in the inerrancy of the word. We believe in the stories of the Bible. We believe that, that, that Bible things happen in Bible ways and all these other things. But do we act upon it? That's what James is talking about. He's saying, no, 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 don't just hit the easy button. Don't just intellectually believe it. Act upon it. That's when the world changes. This is where I think we get stuck. Because I think we hear things like, Elijah made the sun stand still in the sky, but, but to quote Rich Mullins, I can't even keep these thoughts of you from passing by. Oh, we are not as strong as we think we are. We've, 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 taught, we've been taught that, that God just doesn't work that way anymore. We've been taught that God doesn't show up in the ways that he showed up in the Old and New Testament anymore. And whoever, whoever taught us that, what, woe to them. I always heard growing up, well, Paul, miracles and, and, and such and such went away with the apostles. But for the life of me, I can't find that anywhere in Scripture. I can't find that anywhere. And I've looked well, Paul, the Holy Spirit doesn't work like that anymore, uh, but now he just lives in our heart. I, I can't find anywhere in Scripture that the Holy Spirit took an early retirement. All right? I can't, anyway, for the life of me, I can't see it. I've read and I've read and I've read and I can't see it. I think the reason we don't believe in the miraculous today is because we don't have the faith and belief that God works that way anymore. And I believe that is what is holding us back as a church and a movement of God to believe that God can still work miracles today. If you knew my life before Christ, you would know that God still works miracles today because he worked it in my life. Hasn't he worked it in yours? He continually works miracles in my life over and over and over again. Uh, it, it's like, I think it's holding us back as a church because it's like we have this muscle car, like, like a Dodge Hellcat. Ugh. I've always wanted to dodge it. Anyway, uh, but, uh, but instead of actually believing that, that there's an engine under the hood, we just push it everywhere by our own strength and by our own power. 
And how many times in our, in, in, our, in our world or in my life or in the church have I relied on my own strength? Have I relied on my own wisdom? Have I relied on my own power? And I haven't given it to God and said, God, I trust in the Holy Spirit's power to do what I cannot do. That's, that's the power of prayer. God, this situation in my life is way too big. I cannot take care of this. I can't take care of it on my own. I need you. That's dependence. That's where God wants us is to be dependent upon him. But we want to be self-sufficient. And what he's saying is stop. You're messing it up. (laughs) Stop ruining it. You keep trying to do it yourself. If you would just hand it to me, kind of like this Rubik's Cube, man, I'll just keep messing it up. And and Kaysen's over there watching me do this. And he's like, if you would just hand it to me, I can fix it in a couple minutes. And that's the way it is with life and God. He's sitting there going, hey, can, can 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 I work on that for you? Hey, can I work? And we're like, no, no. Actually, I blame you for this. Well, if you would give it to me, no, I'm going to take care of it myself, but I'm going to get mad at you if it doesn't work out. And God's sitting there going, no, just give it to me. Give me that part of your life. And we're like, no, I'm going to take care of it myself. And he's like, okay, I give you free will. I give you free choice. And then when our life is in shambles, we look up to God and go, God, why did you not do anything about it? And he's like, you never gave it to me. You never gave me your life. You never gave me that situation. You believe that you could handle it yourself, but you can't. You can't. You need me. We need God, and we want to, and, and if we want God to show up in a miraculous way and do miraculous things, the first thing that we need to do is to, to lay down at the feet of the cross and just submit our lives to him and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I need your help, and I guarantee God will show up. Seek and you will find. Ask and he shall answer. If we are going to be a church that has any impact at all, it will start when we start praying. Every great movement of God has begun with prayer, praying with faith, praying with boldness, praying with fervor, praying with intention, praying without ceasing, praying bold prayers, expecting miraculous answers from God. But the question is, do we have that type of faith? Do we have that living faith that James talks about? Do we have that type of intimacy that, uh, with God that David had? Uh, do we really believe that God will come through and answer like he did in the past? Like I said, I've read a lot about prayer, and one of the greatest writers that I've read on prayer is, his name is E.M. Bounds, and he said this. He said, prayers are deathless. The lips that uttered them may be closed in death. The heart that felt them may have ceased to beat. But the prayers live before God and God's heart is set on them, and prayers outlive the lives of those who uttered them, outlive a generation, outlive an age, outlive a world. Isn't that beautiful? That the prayers we pray continue to live on. I am standing up here today, and I've told you this multiple times, I am a product of prayer. I'm a product of my grandmother's prayer for me every day. She died before I even became a Christian, but it was her prayer that brought me through. I'm convinced of it. Our prayers will live on. Samuel Chadwick, he said this, the one concern of the devil is to keep the saints from prayer. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. Isn't that true? We know it to be true from our experience because that's the one thing in a lot of our lives that we have trouble with. We just can't find the time to pray. Well, that's not by accident. Satan has has designed it that way to distract us and to keep us from praying. We're going to have to be intentional about it. So the question today, there's two things, Um, and and elders and prayer team, you can go ahead and go to the back, but there's two things. One, if you need prayers, we are here for you. We are here. If you need to 
confess sins one to another. We are here for you. Um, we are a resource. Uh, and two, um, in doing this prayer, it's led me to to want to not just talk about it, but get serious about it. What I would like to do is develop a prayer team. A group of people that are committed to praying. Uh, and, and not just praying for the sick and not just praying for some of the day-to-day -day stuff that's going on in our church, but praying that God would show up in a miraculous way and through his Holy Spirit sweep through our community and, and do amazing things within this community, but also in the larger community as well. Those that have that faith. So I'm starting a prayer team. If you would like to join that prayer team, I don't know all the answers. I don't know what it's going to look like. All I know is we're going to pray. Uh, yes, I have a vision of like a 24-7 prayer room that we would start and all these other things and a prayer labyrinth and, and all these different, different things that, that I want to do. But really, all we're going to do is get together on a regular basis and pray. And then let it evolve from there and see where God wants to lead us. But if you're interested in joining that, please come see me on the stage after worship is over. But if you have any prayer needs, if there are unconfessed sins, trust in the power of prayer. James ends like this, basically. He says his whole thing was basically not just believing the word, but living it. And may we be people who not just learn the intellectual points of faith, but be people who show that um, each day to impact a world that desperately needs the love of Jesus. So let's pray. Father God, to you be praised. As we've sang earlier, you give and you take away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. No matter what you bring our way, Father, blessed be the name of the Lord. We give you all praise and honor. Father, we today submit our lives to you. As a church, we bow down to you and say, Lord, we do not have what it takes to figure out life. We need you. We are dependent upon you for our very breath. We are dependent upon you in every single way, God. So, Lord, we lift up our life to you. We offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. And this is our spiritual act of worship, God. That all that we have is yours. Father, we know that you will guide us. You will lead us. We trust you with our life so much more than we trust our limited knowledge and limited selves, Father. We trust you and ask that you use us, make us, mold us, craft us, transform us, do whatever you have to do to make us ready for your service and then send us out into the world uh, willing and ready to serve those who need you most to bring people back to God. Thank you, thank you for the transformation that you've done in my life and that you continue to do. Father, it is not by my own works that, that, I, that I'm standing up here today. It's only by the grace of God. And I realize that because, Father, um, even though my spirit is willing, my flesh is so weak. Father, my life is continually out of alignment with you, Father, and, and I confess that, Lord, and I pray that, that you help us to all put our lives back in alignment with you. Father, we love you. To you be praised. Blessed be the name of the Lord, and it's through the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.